and we're rolling. Cool. Okay, I already already prayed in, so in case anybody wants to judge me for not praying. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being a part of our training, Congregational Care Prayer Team. Let me go. Let me start by kind of telling you why we formed this team and what the purpose of it is. And the purpose is twofold. The first part is to our big goal is to have everybody prayed for in this congregation. And it's a big goal, but it's, it's an idea that everyone will have a prayer warrior praying over their family. Okay. And for me, this is where I really bought off on it. The idea, I, I put myself in the position of somebody who is getting prayed for. And the idea that there's somebody out there who you know, didn't know me before now, and they're specifically praying over my family and particularly my kids. That really, that really hit me big time. The idea that somebody I didn't know would come up and go, hey, you know, I prayed for Dylan this week. I know he's got something coming up on Wednesday, you know. Or I know that, you know, Ian's got a test coming up, so I prayed for him. That to me, like, that makes me very emotional just even thinking about it, you know. And the idea that we could do this for everybody in the congregation to me was like, that's a goal worth having. And the thing is, I'm going to have to recruit hundreds of people for this. It's going to be years in the making. But to me, it's like that's a, that's a goal worth having. And, that, and, that, and I think and then our church is worthy of that in terms of the value that, you know, the way this church treats people and the way people feel when they come to this church, this is just right in perfect line with our culture. Okay. Um, it's going to have a huge impact on families. And as Larry had said earlier, it's going to impact you guys too. Because unselfishly praying for somebody, you know, every day of the week and focusing on what they need in their family is going to change you and your outlook, too. It's going to have a huge impact. And on the flip side of that <clears throat> is pastoral care needs. So I'm over the empowering ministries here. It's about, right now, about 15 different ministries, maybe a couple more. And here's how it works. <clears throat> My job is to ensure that we have a healthy congregation, uh, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And so we have, we do more in the area of pastoral care than any other church in the country. And that's straight from Fred. And so um, it's a big part of who we are as a church. And I think it's a big reason why we are who we are as a church. And um, so of the people, just imagine the people in our church that are hurting and need, and need our help. Okay, whatever percentage that is. And of those people, some of them will come forward and ask for help. So they'll either sign up for a class or a ministry. They'll come to me and say, hey, you know, my marriage is in trouble. Can you help me? Or I'm struggling with an addiction. Can you help me? Or whatever. So those people we can plug in right away. You know, yes, we can help you. Here we go. Well, it's the other folks, the ones that are hurting, that need help and that don't come forward that are my concern and are the ones that I'm constantly trying to figure out how to get to. Because I think as we all know, when you're hurting, you have more of a tendency to isolate and you don't want to come forward. What I figured out through a lot of trial and error is one way to not get to them is to advertise and say, hey, if you're hurting, come forward. Literally no one comes forward because, you know, it's like it's, a, it's when you're hurting, you don't want to come forward. Hey, I'm the hurting person. You know, it's, it's much, a much more personal thing. And so this is another avenue through which we can find people that are hurting. It's Because it's all about the personal connection. That's how they come forward. They will tell a friend, I am hurting, you know. And so in this situation, and I'm going to get to the details um, in a little bit, but it's basically the idea of when you're praying for somebody, there, there's a good opportunity for them to tell you what's going on in their lives, something that might be of a challenge, something where they're hurting, you know. Pray for my marriage, we're going through a bad whatever. That's an opportunity for you then to talk to them and say, hey, you know what? We've actually got a ministry that deals with that. Do you mind if I just have a pastor give you a quick call about that and just let you know about it? No, you know, no commitment or anything. It's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. You know? And it's, a, it's that personal connection that makes them go, okay, I will come forward. So it's another avenue through which we can find people that are hurting. So it's twofold. And the two of the most important you know, elements, I think, of our church culture, getting people covered with prayer and then also determining... Um, if they have any pastoral care needs. So it's a, real, it's a dual function and both are very important. Um, so what we're doing here is intercessory prayer. And I've literally recruited probably hundreds of people for intercessory prayer teams. And people love being a part of it. And I mean, it's, we don't have a problem 
building these teams in our church. But one of the first questions that literally everyone asks is, what is intercession? What exactly is it? And that's a totally valid question because it's something that's not talked about a lot. So I'm going to have Mark kind of go over um, kind of in detail what intercession is so you guys can kind of get a, get a feel for it. Okay. So why don't we start with prayer? Let's do that. Okay. Lord, we um, ask for your presence today as we take a look at your word and the examples of intercessory prayer that we find. We find that all members of the body of Christ are intercessors and that we all can pray for our families, our marriages, our relationships, our careers, our church, those that are hurting. It, there's no limit. And so Lord, today just open up our hearts and that let us know what is um, really what we need to know about this subject and how it applies to us and how we can go forth and really accomplish great works for the kingdom through intercessory prayer. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to have several handouts today. And the purpose is, is that, uh, I have some scriptures laid out and everything that when you're away from here, it's something you can go back and refer to. And uh, so give you something to take with you. You know, so I'm, I'm going to give you a gift today. <laughs> Paper, I think. All right. So anyway, um, what I want to start with, and I'm going to uh, turn to the book of Mark. And I don't know if anybody, I, I probably could have brought some Bibles in There's here. There's some Oh, there are some? Um, Behind you. Let me just grab those real quick in case you want to follow them on. I got them. Here you go. All right. Okay. I want my phone. I just. Alrighty. Very good. We're going to be turning to the Book of Mark. I'll share with you until. And um, where it's very early on in Mark, I think it's chapter one. That's pretty early on, right? Yeah. So. We'll take a look at the scripture there in just a moment. I'll just kind of have it ready for you. And. Uh, I'm also going to give you a handout. You could just kind of pass these around. Uh, just go back and go back around there and everybody have one. Yeah. <clears throat> and as we know, we're videoing this so that um, others can get the same training. And uh, so uh, um, if you're watching this video, there will be an email that comes with these attachments with it so that you can have this to follow along with. So. <laughs> All right, so um, the first part is there's a book that we use uh, around the vineyard quite a bit called Celebration of Disciplines by Richard Foster. Um, if you haven't purchased this book, it would be a great book to add to your library uh, for it really gives you a lot of insight on uh, how to develop some disciplines uh, that will grow your work in Christ and your relationship with him. And so uh, in that book, Foster writes, prayer catapults us onto the frontier of the spiritual life. It is the discipline of prayer that brings us into deepest and highest work of the human spirit. Real prayer is life creating and life changing. And I think anyone that has spent much time in prayer finds it out very quickly. Most commonly, the Lord works on us first. We change from the inside out. So in the reading of his word, you can't depart from that because that's the, where we get most of our knowledge of who God is and uh, how he's laid out a plan. And that there's a story of God. And we're all in the middle of the story of God. And the beauty is we all have our place in his story. And so um, with prayer, we have that opportunity to actually commune with him. Probably one of the things in prayer that most people don't talk about is we think about prayer is that we're going to God to make our request to Him. In fact, in Philippians, it actually talks about us making our request to Him. But what we don't think a lot about is sometimes prayer is more going to listen. And so once we've kind of gotten things off our chest and we're ready to be able to receive, God pours into us through prayer. And so it's the meditation on His Word and it's the time that we spend in prayer that makes a difference. 
So when you think about being an intercessor, an intercessor for the kingdom, you're, you're thinking about, hey, I'm actually going to go to prayer for someone else. And we're going to talk about a couple of examples of that in Scripture and find that it was one of those powerful prayers in the Bible is intercessory prayer. He continues on and says, Jesus set the example on the importance of prayer. And that's where I want to take you to Mark chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, turn to chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verse 35. And this is speaking of Jesus. Jesus has been preaching and teaching. And he's been healing the sick. Um, and then all of a sudden it says, in fact, Jeremy, why don't you read that? 35? Yep, verse 35. Before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to prayer. Yeah. Sorry. And in some versions, it says this, And in the morning, a great while before, di uh, before day, he rose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. And what we know of Jesus is that he spent a lot of time in prayer. He was always going to a garden or up on the mountain to be alone to pray. And a lot of times he did it after he did a lot of teaching and just before he did teaching. Um, there's the example where uh, he sent the disciples before him across the Sea of Galilee. Uh, he said, I will meet you. And he went to be alone. And we know that what Jesus did was pray. And then that was the one where the storm came up on the water and he's actually looking out where he can actually see what's going on. And then he comes walking on the water. Uh, so an amazing uh, recording a record in scripture so anyway uh, the disciples freed up time uh, in acts 6 4 it says that the disciples freed up time by allowing others to serve uh, so that when, then they could actually spend more time in prayer and teaching the word so when you look at jesus now it's interesting because if you watch the disciples what do they do they emulate what jesus does and what does jesus tell us I do what the Father does. And so this connection is very strong. And so it continues, if you look here in verse 36 in chapter 1, later Simon and the others went out to find him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go to the other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. Jesus, when he went to prayer, he remembered his purpose, to seek and to save the lost. And so he was centered in that mission. And when we go to prayer, we're centered in that mission. And he tells us to take our cares before him. So as intercessors, as we think about what an intercessor is, if you look at your handout, um, we've got a number of scriptures that we can actually see in this. One thing I want to do real quick is um, I brought a couple Bibles with me, two particular ones in a journal. And this particular Bible happens to be my mother-in-law's Bible. She passed away in 1987, and um, she had a brain tumor, <clears throat> went pretty quick. But she was a servant of the Lord. To give you a little history on her, uh, her and her husband, Bob, um, had their first child, and he was Robert Jr. And Robert Jr. was about five years old, and he was out with his dad, and his dad was running a road maintainer. He was a farmer, but he was doing this as a side job, and they hit a bump, and uh, one of the toys of his son went moving across the bed of the, or the floor of the front of the truck, and he reached for it and fell out, and before his dad could stop it, he, he ran over him, and it killed him. Hmm. Now, many may not know this, the a loss of a child in a marriage sometimes makes it very difficult for the marriage to survive. And in this particular case, um, Bob had been raised by a father and he had lost his mother as a child. And when his father, when they had death in their family, the father would just go make the arrangements and then come back and tell the family one of the siblings or whatever had died. Well, Bob did the same thing. He picked up his child, took him right to the mortuary, made the arrangements, and then he went home and told Jean. To me, that would have been a very difficult time, right? But the beauty of it is, is that somehow God had her heart. That marriage lasted until Jean 
passed away. And I think it was probably close to 40 years. I was looking at her Bible, and this woman was a woman that taught little children at church, and she had a prayer, and I'll let you look at it here. This is her prayer, and I'm going to read it to you. And it says in the corner over here, my keeping on keeping on prayer. I'm out of breath, Lord, for going the extra mile so often for so many. My capacity to give feels drained, washed out, expended, and dried up. I'm tired and I feel cheated. I guess I want a chance to, to bask in praise, recognition, appreciation, and even acclaim. Forgive selfish introspection, Lord, and needless self-pity, misdirect, misdirected, unjustified grudges, and my complaining spirit. Remind me that I, too, make mistakes. Let people down. Act on selfish whim. Give me strength to keep on giving and loving and caring and serving. When no reward, a reward is in sight and when no one is there to say thanks, let my joy be in doing the unrecognized job. Amen. Now, I knew this woman, and I loved her dearly. So, you know, to have a mother-in-law that you love that much. Um, my mother passed away from cancer five years later. So I lost both moms pretty early on. But I have been moved and touched. And the reason why I share this is that as we move forward today, as you think about being an intercessor, not only for your own family, but for other families within our church and for yourself, because you intercess for yourself as well. If you recall in John 17, the very first part of that is Jesus prayed for himself first. Then he prayed for the disciples. And then the third section in that chapter is he prayed for those who would come to believe, for all believers. So as we move into this, I just want to say what you do now matters in your witness that will remain a legacy for years after you pass. Jean is one of the examples. I'm gonna share her husband, Bob, in a moment, and or a little later in our lesson today, because there's something I think you need to see. So anyway, that's that one for you today. So as uh, I wanna draw back now to this, what is intercession? So if you were to define it, what would you define intercession as? Just going to God in place of someone, like for on someone's behalf. Yeah. And we all need it, but at a different time, you know. We need yeah. to be strong for each other. Very true. Anybody else want to share? We're going to look at some examples of that, but an intercessor is one who takes the place of another or pleads or presents another's case. So you're going on their behalf to make a plea, a plead for someone else. And so um, when, my, when Jean had cancer, I made a plea that God would, would heal her. Jean said, I think I'm going home, Mark. And so let me go home. And so I had to release that because she was ready to go and she wanted to go be with the Lord. My mother, a little different. She wanted the prayer, and initially God healed her. And her cancer came back a few years later, and that time it took her. But there's an amazing story behind that, which we don't have time to cover today, but I can tell you God had a plan, and he worked it. And her life meant even more because of that period of time that she had between getting it initially and passing. That is the way it is in life, that sometimes we pray, and we see answers immediately. Sometimes it takes continued prayer over time and over a process of time we see healing. And sometimes it's where we pray and we pray and then what we see the result that we didn't really want to see and we don't really understand fully and we probably won't in this life. But yet we know that if it comes, if we just talk about the healing, that they are healed. They're either healed here 
or they're healed in heaven. They're healed. And God gives them a new, they're a new creation. They have a new life. And so uh, we know that he answers our prayer, but sometimes it's not always in the way that we think. Okay? And sometimes through powerful changes in life, powerful things happen that, uh, that advance the kingdom of God. Okay, so intercessory, yeah. They, we go in the place of another, we plead and present the case. And there's a biblical basis of this in the New Testament, uh, believer in intercessory prayer. And in 1 Peter 2.4, it tells us that we're a holy priesthood. Secondly, in 1 Peter 2.9, it says we're a royal priesthood. And in Revelation 1.5, it says we are a kingdom a priest. And, and the understanding is going back to the Levitical priesthood is it was a responsibility of the priest to stand in or stand before in between God and man and make the you know make amends. So we did it through sacrificial system, um, and it could be through offerings. There was many ways that the priest actually represented mankind. Now it's hard for us because we think, oh wait a minute, I'm not a priest, but the Bible says we are. When we come to Him then we take on that responsibility. And there's a lot of scripture that talks about the fact that we should take on the burdens of, our, of another believer, that we cast our cares on Jesus. But we, we share the burdens together, and, we, and the purpose of sharing it isn't so that we get weighed down so we can't serve, but that together we gain strength and go to God together in power and in strength, that God would move, Okay. When his people begin to pray, throughout history, revival comes. Change happens. We want to reach the Northland. We want to reach Kansas City for the kingdom of God. The pathway is through prayer. Through understanding his word, continue to be good servants of studying the word, our, our stewards of the word, and advancing the kingdom through prayer, and then by living it out. Living in the confidence and the expectation of God moving in our midst. Okay, so we're actually under the Melchizedek priesthood, and it's spoken in the passage as a new order of spiritual priests to whom the Lord Jesus is the high priest. And the power and the beauty of this is Jesus is still our intercessor. Because the scripture tells us he sits next to the Father and intercesses for us at the right hand of the Father. So that's pretty powerful. And then he, as God does, which is so amazing to me, and I, I, I've never really, it, it's when you sit and really meditate it and you really try to, to draw what, what they were thinking because it's the plan of God that Jesus would come and then Jesus would leave. And I go, he goes to be with the Father, but he says he gives us a mission, Right? We're to go and tell others. We're to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit and to teach them all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He takes the most precious gift, the most precious gift that has ever been given. And he says, Tammy, Jeremy, and I don't know your name. Pam. Pam, thank you. And Pam, Larry, and Shane. He says, I'm going to give this gift to you that you would give it to others. And he gives us that purpose. The God, the creator of all things, says, this most precious gift I give to you to give away. That is incredibly powerful. And so God is calling you forth to be one of those intercessories that get to give the gift of taking the cares and the concerns of others before him, that he might move powerfully. And you get the blessing because, see, it's not just them that get a blessing. Whenever you give, you always get. It's the way God works. You receive. And so through in, in giving to others through prayer and intercession, you change a life. You change yours and theirs. Okay. So 
Um, the scripture that I'll give you a reference um, in 1 Timothy 2.5, which is near the end of your uh, handout, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is our mediator. That's why we go to him in prayer. And who is it that he condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Romans 8.34. So you want to take a break for a minute or two? Um, let's do this. Let me cover boundaries real quick, and then we'll take a break. Okay. Sound like a plan. I'm going to hand out... That last part you just read. Oh, it's not in the handout? Right. No. Um, 1 Timothy 2.5 and Romans 8.34. Yes. I'm going to take one and pass it around. Can you send these to us electronically? As well? I can. Is that what you were asking earlier? Yes, ma'am. Romans what? Um, 8.34. I won't be able to see sign la language when people watch the video, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'll figure it out. We do have yeah, I know where this came from. I know. Yeah, yeah, you know <laughs> um, what you're seeing now is um, excellent job, by the way. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to talk about boundaries. This handout you're getting is from the Stephen Ministry teaching that we do. And. Um, you guys are drawn to prayer because you, I mean, you know, for all the reasons that that Mark was talking about, you have, you have great empathy, you have love of people, and you want to be there for them. It's a very unselfish thing. Now, every gift that we get from God is is kind of a double-edged sword. It's a huge blessing, but then it can also be become something that is not a blessing. Okay, everything. And uh, empathy and sympathy is one of those things. So um, I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> where we want to land in our relationship with people. So there's a possibility, and you know, it's not necessarily going to be this way, but there's a great possibility that you will get um, to build a relationship with the families that you're praying for, that they will contact you and say, hey, you know, Tammy, thanks for praying for me. Uh, if you could be in, in prayer about these things this week, that'd be great. So you're going to get to know the inner workings of their family, their kids. You know, that's a very intimate place to be, right? It's a, it's a real it's sacred ground. It's a big privilege, you know. So one of the things that can happen in that situation is that we start to have some boundary issues. So it's really important to start to discuss kind of how we want to traverse this. What do we want to be where we're not too far away, but we're not too close. So in, uh, in Stephen ministry, we all have a, 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 sim a symbolic gesture, a thing called the mud hole. And if you look, and in those that are watching online, you'll have this handout. But the person that's circled in the mud hole, and that's in uh, focus note eight on the cover, um, is the person that needs help. All right? And so these are the three different places, one, two, and three, that we can be. Now, if you look at um, number, let's start with number two. Number two is when you get down in the mud hole with the person, okay? That's over-identifying. That's too much, okay? And I, I go through this with all of my ministries, especially within, like, for Oaks Ministry, where if you're acting as a ministry leader to somebody, um, what's okay and what's not? This is what I was kind of a rule of thumb I let people know. If you're, you know, it's, it's okay to become emotional about what you're hearing. That's actually good and healthy. But I always say, if you're crying more than the person talking, that's a bad thing. That's a good, you know, don't do that. That's a no-no. You've gone too far, okay? Um, and so that's where the person that's getting down in the mud hole, you have kind of lost your boundary to where you're losing sleep over what's going on with this family or that you're contacting them too much, you know, or it becomes something of great concern for you. Um, that's too much. And again, this is the, we're talking kind of vague terms here, but I think you'll know when you're spending too much time in an unhealthy way thinking about the family you're praying for, okay? Um, and if you look over in section B for over-identification, in the second page, over-identification means taking on the care receiver's feelings and characteristics to the point that the caregiver is just as overwhelmed as the care receiver is, okay? So obviously, we don't want to be there. Now let's look at the figure number one who's standing on top of the, you know, kind of on the, the cliff there. This is the person that is actually too distant. You're remaining too detached from what's going on, okay? So <clears throat> that's more like a clinical 
observation you're making. Oh, I see what you're going through, <clears throat> but you're not really, again, you're kind of remaining detached from the situation, you know, cold, clinical, unemotional, okay, I'll pray for you. That's also something that we want to avoid. Is that number one in the diagram? Yeah, that's number one, standing on the cliff. So if you look at um, sympathy, this is focus note nine, that would be sympathy is feeling concern for someone else without becoming involved in his or her life. All right, so we want to stay away from that too. Where if you're, if I'm the part of the family and I'm telling you as my intercessor, here's what, what's going on. This is a really important, deep thing or something that's like very emotional. And you just say, okay, thanks, I'll, I'll pray about it. I think that's going to create a dynamic between you where it's like, wow, this person doesn't even care. You know what I mean? I don't even want to share things because I feel almost embarrassed that I'm sharing this in-depth thing and that they're just kind of nonchalant about it. So if you're detached from it, that's almost just that's also a bad place to be. And again, I, I go back to we're talking about very vague terms here. So there's not an exact definition I can give you, but I think you'll be able to kind of feel around, ask God for guidance as to what you're doing to make sure that you're in the right spot. So the right spot is empathy. So if you look at number three in the diagram, this is what's happening. They're leaning down into the pit holding on to something to, to keep them steady, but they're reaching out to the person in the pit, all right? So they're in that, that, that balance in between, all right? So that's a place of empathy, and that's focus note 11. Empathy is feeling another's problems as if they were your own without actually taking them on for yourself. So, for instance, in ministry, like in Oaks, I was, for me, if I've done ministry with somebody, <clears throat> And you can hear some really, really in-depth things. If afterwards it stays with me the rest of the day and I'm thinking about it, then I've lost, I've lost some, some, some boundary. You know, it's, it's bothering me and I'm thinking about it, how this is going to turn out. But if I leave and at that exact, in the, in the moment of ministry, I'm right there with him and I'm feeling it with him, I'm leading him through. But then as soon as I pray out, <clears throat> I'm done. There's not, it doesn't linger with me. It doesn't, you know kind of haunt me the rest of the day, then I know I've got the right balance. You know, when I'm with them, it's there. Um, I've had situations where people will te are telling me going through their story, it's a, you know, a very sad story about something that happened to them as a kid or some kind of abuse they suffered. And I'm able to kind of walk them through. I mean, I, I, I understand what they went through and I feel that pain, but I'm able to continue with the ministry and I walk them through it. And then as soon as we're done praying out, I'll break down for a moment and just kind of like cry and just think, and I think God leads you to that point where now you can, you can release it. It's good, you know. You don't want to do that while you're doing prayer, but then I release it quickly, and then I'm done with it, you know. But I don't feel that emotion until it's done and my, my work is done at that spot, okay. So kind of, like I say, this kind of gives you a, a continuum. So if you find yourself thinking about your family, and, I, and again, it's, it's, it's a difference where, oh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've been prompted to pray for them, you know, outside of my regular prayer time. I want to pray for this person. That's fine. But if you find yourself getting anxiety and wanting to contact them and how are things going and more than you should, then you're probably at a point where you're, you're losing your boundary, okay? And so it's something you just, you're, and again, there's going to be times where it just kind of flows back and forth. And if you're, if you're in one, one spot or the other, momentarily it's not a big deal but if you find yourself constantly worrying or not caring at all for a, a long period of time like throughout the week that's where you need to be concerned and ask God to really give you guidance on that. are yeah. we going to be provided one another's information so that if we see that happening we can intercede for each other I mean you know like if we see that happening we can say can you support me in this um let me think about that what we're, what we're doing right now is uh, since we have such a small group, I'm over, I'm your coach in this, right? And so if there's an issue, I'd want you to check in with me because I think everybody else is kind of in their own situation and may not be at a point where they can, you know, uh, but I will be, you know, and I'll be able to bring in people to pray for you guys and support you guys, and I'll be praying for you guys too. Yeah. So at this point, if, you, if there's issues within your, you know, and I'll be checking in with you guys. And so, but if there's a point where you think you're losing your boundary one way or the other, you come to me and then I will kind of walk you through it at this point. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. What questions do you guys have about this? What, what, how can I help you in understanding this? Let me, let me, mm -hmm. 
uh, jump in here just for a second on that before we go to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, this is a new program. I think it is one of the greatest programs we've, that have ever actually come along, and that is praying. I mean, if you think about it, we got about 3,000 average attenders. And if we assign about an average of 10 per intercessor, so that could be two families, because if, you know, if you have three, four people in a family, to get to 10, uh, it may take two to three families. Okay, so you're praying for two or three families. So that means it's gonna take about 300 intercessory prayer leaders. And the game plan is that we will actually split that out and have leaders over prayer uh, teams and that will take time before we get there, but there will be an organizational plan to that. But in the early stages, whenever you're birthing a new ministry, then there needs to be a lot of communication, especially with the lead pastor, so that they can hear what's happening, what kind of bumps there are in the, along the way, and help us guide us there because we'll become stronger. And I wouldn't be surprised that some of the leaders that will eventually lead over 10, or over more uh, wouldn't actually come from our initial people because mm -hmm. they've had the experience of going through what this looked like in the early stages. Mm -hmm. So you're really helping us develop a ministry that I think will move our church forward powerfully because we're going to undergird it in prayer. Mm -hmm. So awesome what you're doing. And that's another good point. I'll just <clears throat> quick that um, going forward, you know, we've got. You know, Fred does not stop in terms of his plans. We've got major plans coming up in terms of we're, we're breaking ground this year on our new children's wing, you know. And the, the plans aren't getting smaller, they're getting bigger. And the, all of those things need to be, as Mark said, undergirded in prayer, you know. Because in order for this church to move forward the way it's supposed to, we're going to need more prayer. We're going to need more people supporting it. And so for me, I want my kids to go to this church, I want my grandkids to go to this church. I'd love them to be pastors here someday. And so for those of us right now who are pastors, who are planning out and being part of the next couple decades, you know, we've got to make sure we're setting it up for them to have the right church, you know, to set it up to where we're, we're turning it over to the next generation in, in, proper, in a proper way, you know, where everything's ready for them to grow exponentially after we're all gone, you know. And I never thought about that until, you know, until I got on staff here, until I turned 50, where I'm like, oh, okay, I won't be around forever. So <laughs> I need to really think about what's coming up, not just today. So that's just a side note. But uh, what, other, what questions do you guys have about boundaries? Anything I can answer or put a finer point on? One of the questions I see hard is defining the boundary of the family. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. yeah. today's family could be, you know, um, one that... I would consider a more old-fashioned where mm -hmm. you have the whole family mm -hmm. within a very small radius mm -hmm. and so they see each other weekly and they're and so that is truly the whole family the brothers the sisters yeah. aunts uncles cousins you know mm -hmm. because they're very close where others are you know um, very distant from their families they only talk every once in a while yeah. they see and so the family nucleus is smaller mm -hmm. and there would be an occasional reach out right or the friends may be more of mm -hmm. a family to them. So that yeah. definition of the boundary of mm -hmm. who it is, you know, your pay, help pray for, for <coughs> their family and how they define their family. Yeah, it'll be different with everybody, I bet. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, you know. Yeah. And they may bring in other people like, well, could you also pray for? I was like, yeah, sure, why not, you know. Nope, sorry, they're not in your family. Yeah, so let me know, okay, <laughs> not on the list. Yeah. No prayer for that. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and so the way we're going to break it up is uh, I had my assistant, and it was, it was a much bigger job than I anticipated. She went through, and we just do this alphabetically, you know, start, and we and just she tried to make as close to groups of 10 as she could, but, you know, so there'll be like, okay, there's a single person, there's a, a single mom with two kids, there's a family of eight, you know, and so she had to sit there and combine them. I had no idea it was going to be such a big deal, you know. And so anyway, so we had to group them into groups. So some of your groups are going to be, 12, some of them are going to be 8, just kind of how the, the dividing line. We'll get to that in a little, in a little bit here, so just so you know how it is. So, uh, but anyway, I, will, I won't go into that now, but that's kind of the way it's going to break down. Okay, so. Because I, I can see the, the time and the per just depending upon how that family boundary oh, is, yeah. could be, you know, very oh, overwhelming yeah. at times. Yeah, very much so, yeah. 
So it'll be, yeah. it's, it's all going to be different. I think each family is going to be different. So Yeah, and I think it is important to know the other ancestors uh, so you're communicating uh, as a team, you know, knowing who else is involved. Say, hey, by the way, how are you doing? You know, and, and maybe hearing about things like that. And of course, I think Dirk is going to, I mean, he's got a lot of experience here in ministry. And coming to him, he's going to be able to help you maneuver through. And especially if it ends up that you're you're gaining more than what we thought, mm -hmm. it might be that we'll move a couple of families away and let you spend more time mm -hmm. with, with one because you'll be more intimately understanding what the needs of prayer is for that family. So, and tell me if you're going to talk about this later, mm -hmm. Lincoln. Um, but like, how? What are the requirements? Like, how are you deciding what families to kind of start with? They, it's, they all, everybody. If they're, if you're an active attender in this church. Okay, so just kind of a random. Because mm -hmm. my concern, it like, and this is very much my personality, where I might have chunks of time where I'm more serious stuff, but mm -hmm. I hesitate. Like, I don't want to bother people with minimal things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have those, like, some people don't have a lot of drama. and mm -hmm. Or maybe they do, and they haven't uncovered it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can't, like, dismiss those because then... We do lose a lot of kind of the contemporary, you know, big chunk of the church that just maybe hasn't gone that deep with themselves, mm -hmm. or maybe they don't have a lot of trauma, or mm -hmm. maybe they dealt with the trauma, mm -hmm. but you still have everyday kind of weird, don't seem like a big deal prayers mm -hmm. that, you know, my dog's poop looked funny yesterday, so <laughs> can you guys pray? I mean, that's a big deal to me. Absolutely. But you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. so I didn't know if you were like just picking people that. Oh, God, no, no. Everybody. Because and you're and you're right though because God's concerned about all of that. That's yeah. what you have to remember because it's yeah. easy for the, you know, my son's a drug addict and my marriage is falling apart. It's like okay, there's a lot to pray about, but we all have stuff, and I'm totally down with that. It's like I mean, you know, um, you know, my kid has kind of a snotty attitude. Can you pray about yeah, that? Yeah, you know, it's a big like, deal when you're going through it. Truly, yeah. you know, and so there's nothing that's there's nothing that we you know, that's too small for God. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. My car broke down. What am I going to do? You know, and it's like. It's it, it, I it, I always try I just caution people don't dismiss like well people got bigger problems than me it's like well yeah but you still doesn't mean you don't deserve prayer for it you know what I mean and so that's why I say you're gonna see just such a continuum I think of you're gonna get some that are real prayer intensive like oh wow I gotta really go to work on these folks I was like no nah, I'm having a pretty good week but you might want to pray on this you know type of thing so I think there's just gonna be a nice variety you know it'd be nice to get people out of the. Good vibes culture. I know. I, that drives me insane. <laughs> Prayers and good vibes. Well. Pick one. I know. I know. You either believe in prayer or you want good vibes. I don't know. I know. It's true. You're gonna, I mean, and you have to work through that, people. Yeah. And, and you get a lot of people that are going to be like, yeah, things are great. And it's like, and you may know that they're not great, but you... But even if they are great, we are called to intercede. I mean, it, yay. Thank you, God. Yeah, absolutely. For things being so great, because they're going to go through a season that's not as great. And Yeah. I mean... That's exactly right. That's because, I mean... If you know anything about family life, is that it's cyclical. You know, if you have kids, you have a lot going on in your life. There's just it's just law of averages. There's just going to be good times and bad, and so you may be going through something now or not. It's going through something now, but at the end of the year, maybe something's going to happen. And I'll, I'm going to be there, and you're going to know me, and we're going to be able to go through this together. You yeah, know? there's there's a way to look at that, and um, if you were to graph that on a whiteboard. And if we weren't doing a video, I'd get up and do the whiteboard right now. So I'm going to try to do it here. Side, side. This is a whiteboard. <laughs> this is a whiteboard. And this, this is a marker. Okay. And if you were to chart your life, if you went back and said, okay, I was born here. And you just marked, okay, I think that was a high. I was born. I think that's a high. And then issues that come along life. Like for me, um, it could be that, you know, I played basketball and I got injured and it took me off the court for a while. That was a downer. So all of a sudden, I got a, a dot down here. And then um, I came back, but in the rehabilitation, I actually got better in some of my skills and came back stronger than I was before. So it was kind of like that little bit of diversion there had a positive effect long term. At the time, it didn't seem like it. But if you take a person's life, like when my mom died, that was a pretty big negative to me. When Pat's mother died, but, but in between there, we had the birth of a child. That was pretty exciting, okay? So if you look at a graph of people's lives, you're gonna see it's like a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. There's ups and downs. 
gets boom, boom. Well, boom, and there's boom, benchmarks, boom. but there's also everyday little things, and that's kind of exactly. what I was saying. I'm more of the right. everyday little thing person. So what that really gives you is there are times when you're more in the season of prayer. So in other words, in intercessory prayer is going to become... Uh, where we're going to be spending a little more time, and then there would be seasons where you go like, "Well, I'm not having to pray too much right now, because things are going well." Okay, so that's good. But just recognize there'll be times when you'll put a little more time on it, but relief is coming. God will work through that, and your ministry will move forward. Okay. Well, also when you, it's like you have somebody that's everything's great. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the least greatest thing and I'll pray for that and maybe we'll make it the best greatest thing in your life. And, but I, th I think that we're making a mistake by thinking that way. I mean, I think, of course, there's more intensive prayer going on when it's a serious issue or even a negative like that we want to change. But we need to, especially in the times that we live, we need to celebrate good. Exactly. We need to ask that God, you know, exactly. really juice those people up with this mm -hmm. good so that when they have those declining moments, mm -hmm. They have that energy and strength. And also that that's a good time I, I found in my own life to pray for that God would reveal things to me. Yeah, exactly. It, okay. I mean, I feel like sometimes prayers, and this might just be my perception, but prayer it seems like always this serious, like, oh, Lord, you know. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to. I learned a long time ago, and it was the best thing that happened to me, that while I'm brushing my teeth, just to talk to God and mm -hmm. say thank you. And yep. I think... I thank God every day for my dog's healthy poops, and you know why. Yeah. She went through for the first two years of her life, life threat. I mean, it was, you know, and so now for the last year, every day, several times a day, <laughs> he gets, you know, a praise, and, and I love him, and I, it's genuine, and it's still praying. So mm -hmm. I don't think, I think people will think they can't ask for prayer because it has to be this serious, mm. big thing. And then when they have this serious big thing, they feel superficial. Whereas, and I'm saying they, and I guess I mean me. I mean, I'm there too. <laughs> Whereas if we get in the habit of always praying, even when things are going well, I mean, that's what God wants. Mm -hmm. You guys are all parents. Yeah. Yep. You, you want your kids to talk to you all the time, yeah. right? That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, we prayed for the Spirit to be in this room, and you're bringing up a very serious point, and I'm glad that, that you felt convicted about it because that's right. You know, prayer isn't just about the down things. It's about giving praise and, and, and saying, Lord, thank you. And when the, when the Lord is moving powerfully in a life, both positively and negative, we take that to the Lord. We should even give praise because, Lord, what are, we, we know that they're being challenged here in their life. And I can't wait to see what the result in this is going to be as you make what's difficult in their life into good. And so we pray forward that the goodness of God would be, would be done. And this might also be a, a prelude to people that we need to spin off out of the, not out of the family, but I mean, mm -hmm. but might need more yeah. intensive care. That's the pastoral care piece of it. The, right. exactly. Exactly. It's exactly. Pastoral, exactly. Exactly. Or other resources. Yeah. Well, and I think that Tammy brings up a good point in that it's also an opportunity, and then it's not that we're as intercessors that we're going to be, you know, Called, called to be educators, but it's an opportunity. If they hear you pray for, you know, if they say, well, I'm just going to pray, I'm thankful that you got this this week. It'd be like, it'll be an opportunity for them to, under, to have a, a better understanding of prayer as well. It's like, oh yeah, I guess I could pray for just being thankful that my kids are healthy and that this is going well. That's a great opportunity for them to learn, you know, that's not the purpose of why we do this, but it's a great offset of, oh yeah, they can also learn through your prayers how God looks at them and another way different ways that they can pray as well you know so well it's important to look back on the you know the the, the typical prayer the first thing you want to do is you open up in prayers you, you, you're praising thanks mm -hmm. thanksgiving I mean you he wants to be he wants to hear the thanks that you're happy mm -hmm. for before you bring the deep yeah. to him you know yeah. and there's times you got to just shoot a flare prayer and go Lord this is, I'm skipping the thanks and I'm going straight <laughs> to needs right but it, you open the thanks and you open the prayer and it even goes back to not even praying it's conversation yes exactly it's conversation yep. with like I picture myself in front of the king and just going hey dude listen man right. I, I thank you for everything that you've done in this family mm -hmm. what you're giving them right now is abundant joy but Lord just when the time comes mm -hmm. be with that family more you know mm -hmm. and, and giving the thanks and the praise first mm -hmm. just having conversation with them that's I mean, exactly, that's the easiest yeah. part about this. You know, not put the big prayer envelope around yep, it. You know, exactly. it's a conversation envelope mm -hmm. yeah, with all these other people that you're just, you're tied with and you're stuck with and mm -hmm. that you get to have this opportunity with. Mm -hmm. So 
I think it's uh, what we're looking at here is, is just open conversation with God, and then the deep prayer comes from that. Well, I think that it's a matter, of when, and the Bible says to you know pray without ceasing. You know, and yeah. to and to me, that's what day long conversation is with mm-hmm. God. It's just a constant. It's not like okay, this is my prayer time from here to here. It's just an ongoing. That's what I, that's what I strive for at least in terms of all throughout the day. It's just like you say, you're just having a conversation. It's the same way I'd call and you know if you you know your father so when you talk to your dad and you know, guys that are close with their dad. We're just like I gotta share this man. What's going on right now? And like people that talk with their father or you know their mom during the day. That's the kind of thing where he wants to hear. He know he knows about it, but it's like. It's yeah, you love just like you were talking about with your kids. You love when they just share with you. This happened today. This was exciting to me, and so that's where just throughout the day that you're talking to them, and you know, and, and a variety of oh man, thanks for this, God. Thanks for this thing that's happening. Or hey, God, oh, I forgot. Make sure I'm gonna put in a prayer for so and so who's doing this today. You know, that's what we're kind of. That's what it is. An open conversation. I agree. So. And maybe you'll probably address this a little bit later, but and when we're talking family. The best occasion is that you would have everyone present at the time of prayer mm-hmm. and some, one way or another, but, you know, even trying to do that for some families is oh, impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if you're only touching base with one person in the family mm-hmm. and they're passing along, you, you're not sure that, you know, or are you making multiple calls and getting multiple mm-hmm. scenarios from the same family? Mm-hmm. You know that can take even even longer and trying to trying to connect nowadays i mean tag mm. is wonderful but it's a game i hate <laughs> and we'll talk about that later but primarily okay. we're going to be talking to mom and dad okay. you know and the kids we're going to you know get them involved as needed probably that way it keeps it more focused especially like depending on age oh yeah he's, yeah, yeah we'll have the nuts and bolts okay. part of the session yeah. here okay. yeah and it might so. be nice too to have it depending i mean i'm i think i have a different picture in my head of this but I mean, I would want to feel like, like if I, if you and Gina, like she might want to feel like she wants to, maybe it's a marriage thing and she wants to pray. You know, maybe we don't want everyone huddled around, right? you know, mm-hmm. FaceTime and, <laughs> right. and, and say, you know, you just know, so you can ask for yeah. personal requests. I don't know. Yeah, I think Once so too. Yeah. Or, you know, and these are the kind of things that get teased out as we go on. It's a very good Yeah. What works. Yeah. And we got to be careful with the mail as a practical thing. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's a whole other thing too. And, and again, I'll get into that in terms of it's going to be email. And that's another good example though in terms of like boundaries, you know. Um, in terms of that's a very good that's a perfect that's a perfect question mm-hmm. and we will have to kind of sort out you know it's a good question so All right, let's go ahead and take a uh, 10 minute break and then we'll come back and finish up pardon me no you're good 